Welcome everyone. My name is Paola Corti and I am the Open Education Community Manager of the European Network of Open Education Librarians at, uh, at Spark Europe. Today we have our second workshop in a row in this new series called uh, Embrace the Open. And uh, we have our librarians in the network uh, facilitating this workshop for you. Namely, we have uh, Silvia Moes, who is uh, joining us in a moment. We hope she was on holiday, so we, she's supposed to, uh, to connect from the United States. Uh, she's from the Freie University in, in the Netherlands. And we have Mira Baustzuk from the University of Groningen, again from the Netherlands, and Lambert Eller from TIB in uh, Germany. And um, this second workshop is uh, focusing on how to organize your open textbook pilot. And we are taking advantage of the experiences uh, from the members of the network um, to discuss together with you um, some steps that uh, you might want to, to try yourself to start your first pilot with open textbooks. So I'm leaving the floor to Mira now and uh, enjoy this workshop, all of you. Thank you, Paola, and welcome everyone again. Thanks for joining us on this warm, hot July day, uh, maybe during your vacation period as well. Happy to have you here. Um, and let's begin, indeed. Uh, let me get back to the slides. So here we are. Uh, Paula has already introduced us. Uh, happy to have Lambert here and hope that Sylvia will still join us. And uh, let's talk about what we'll do today, what we'll be discussing today. First of all, we want to do a very brief recap of workshop number one that we held a few weeks ago in June, uh, introducing the general topic of open textbooks and some uh, fascinating, inspiring examples from across uh, the world and Europe as well. And then we would like to go into the panel discussion among ourselves uh, and also with you, of course, uh, your questions and insights to talk about what it takes to organize an open textbook pilot or a project and to roll out open textbook service uh, if that is already happening or could be potentially happening at our institutions. We will also have some time for hands-on um, work for you. Um, namely to reflect on your own prospective open textbook pilots and what kind of expertise and resources you already have and you might still need to get it going at your institution. And would like to then discuss it in a plenary session together and uh, see what kind of insights we can pull out all of us together. Now, all of this is to reach the following, uh, well, learning outcomes, uh, so to say. We would like together with you to outline the main steps of what it takes to organize the support base for your open textbook pilot. To examine the role of a librarian, most of us, I assume, are librarians. If you have um, any other position, please write it in the chat. would be really curious to know uh, what institutional service you're coming from, what background you're coming from, and uh, to see what the role we have and can still have in the creation and publishing of the open textbooks. Also to identify the stakeholders in our institutions uh, whom we can get involved in the specific context according to the needs and requirements of our pilots, of our open textbook pilots. And also to, uh, first of all, start to ignite, but also to maintain the collaboration within the working team uh, to make the open textbook pilot a successful enterprise and to potentially translate it into permanent service at your organization. So all of this discussion hopefully will lead to these outcomes or will get us thinking in these directions at least. Now, um, what we did in the previous workshop, in workshop number one, uh, was a rather broad one, introductory one, uh, within the framework of Embrace the Open series. We examined the concept of open textbooks, what they are, uh, what they're not, but also what the benefits of engaging with, with open textbooks are. Um, especially when you get to integrate it into the uh, educational process, into the learning design of a course. We also took a look at the opportunities for integrating textbooks uh, into the course design and uh, instructional practices of our teachers. Um, we took a look at several examples uh, in the current landscape of open textbook publishing practices. Uh, we collected all these examples together in a Padlet 
All of these materials have been shared as well. And in the next slide, you will get the links uh, where you can actually uh, reach out and explore them. So uh, by pulling out all our uh, expertise and knowledge and insights into uh, some amazing work that the educators are doing worldwide in the realm of open textbook publishing, we were able to collect um, a sort of landscape and to imagine what landscape we are operating within, both in the global terms, but more also more locally here in Europe. And we also together reflected on the challenges and opportunities presented by engaging with open textbooks at our institutions. Uh, we didn't have the answers to all of the questions. Some of them will still need to be answered as we go, as we proceed with our own pilots and projects at our institutions. But we could think together in the right directions, I think. And if you have missed it, we have prepared a recording for you. Also, the slides are shared. Uh, the Padlet with, with inspiring open textbook examples are shared, is shared, but also the, the other documents um, that we use for organizing these workshops, uh, the behind the scenes documents have been uh, kindly collected by Paula and shared as well uh, on Zenodo. So if you would like to access it, you can. I think in the YouTube uh, recording notes, you can also uh, find the link to that. Uh, so all of this is available for you to uh, go back to reflect some more, but also to reuse if you would like to give a similar workshop in your own institutions. So now having said all this, uh, let's go into the, the panel discussion, discussion mode. And we would like to begin with sketching um, the, the broad landscape of um, what it takes to set up an open textbook service and project. Um, and we'll be basing on our uh, own institutional examples, on our own reflections, well, Lambert, myself, and Sylvia, if she joins us. And we would like to start with, uh, with a few questions that we've pre-sketched. Um, you will also get an opportunity to tune in and ask your questions and reflect on what we've said and what you've, you've heard from each other. But for now, we would like to start with the first question. What was the reason to start with open textbooks? Um, have you thought about integration into education side of things? Um, how did it go? And I would like to immediately ask that uh, to Lambert. So please go ahead, Lambert. Yeah, so the interesting thing at our place, so I work, um, as Paola already mentioned in the introduction, at a, a library in um, Germany, which is a bigger research library. And uh, in our case, the request for doing something in the space of open textbooks came from the outside. So people from a completely different institution who deal with public health education or so asked me and that make, ma made me think. So this was uh, interestingly from, from, from external, but uh, I'm also interesting to hear from you uh, if you have similar experience that you got the request from some teacher from inside your institution or another one that would be interesting yeah in our case um i work at the university of groningen in, here in the netherlands as paula has mentioned in our case uh, there were several considerations uh why we started some of them were bigger picture considerations so embracing uh the wave of open access movement open science uh, but also, um, well, thinking about broader questions such as access to education, such as sustainable use of public resources, uh, taking control back from the commercial publishers to some extent. So all of these were at play. Uh, but of course, um, it was also fueled by uh, the institutional developments that were happening at that time. We have um, our own University of Groningen Press. It's an open access only uh, diamond open access type publisher um that uh, we have in-house that already had some experience with open access monographs and journals and the logical next step uh, for us was at that point to go into open textbooks to look into open textbooks in parallel we also had um, open educational services being set up oer related services being set up so that was a very harmonious um collaboration and a moment to embrace it and um of course, we've also piled a little bit around um, the university to know if there's any interest in that among the teachers. Um, but that was us asking them instead of, uh, as in your example, them coming to us and asking us if we are able to provide them with the service. Uh, we asked, we heard back, yes, there is interest. There are lots of innovative ideas. And that's how it all started. That's how it all took off. Yeah. I find it also super interesting that you mentioned that you had uh, 
um, have had um, open access services before. So this sounds very familiar, at least in Germany, I think many uh, libraries by now run some kind of open access services while they feel also, uh, so from my experience, when I talk with them about open um, textbooks, that textbooks are a little bit different, right? So they have, uh, this is a special angle. This is not some other open access type of publication. And uh, yeah, so that's interesting. Maybe you can tell us about your experience. Do you start from an open access background or where where do you uh, feel like you have resonance, where you feel like uh, there's a request for, for open textbooks uh, for you, from your perspective? Uh, yeah, that's a good question indeed. And the open textbook um, market or perception seems to be a bit more conservative. Um, from how we experience it in talking to our teachers using the textbooks or the students using the textbooks. Um, and there are certainly a lot of parallels with the open access uh, traditional type of scientific uh, or research output. Uh, but open textbooks always somehow stand apart. And um, as I said, for us, it was a logical next step to also explore this type of publication. Uh, that's not always self-evident uh, for someone who works, uh, you know, uh, with um, with monographs or with uh, journals. But um, again, because of the institutional developments in this regard, uh, that came uh, hand in hand together. And what's interesting also is that for many um, for many teachers, for many researchers, the division between a research output and educational output is not so straightforward as it is sometimes for us on the support side of things, uh, where we categorize things into, okay, this is your research output, this is uh, something uh, that's good for your research career, and we communicate it in this way, while this is an educational thing, we communicate it in a different way, and uh, you know we approach it in a different way. For them, it's not always so straightforward, and very often one flows into the other. Um, so a textbook is not only a product uh, that you only, in, you know, that only has a benefit in your classroom in this way, uh, but also um, a publication where you can um, actually valorize your research, the research outcomes, the research findings um, that you have to share with the rest of the world. Uh, it's also a way to uh, to engage students more with um, the scientific thinking, with becoming uh, the new generations of research. So there are many, many angles where one flows uh, into the other. And I think the division um, to only keep it very separate, very, uh, you know, stratified is uh, more of an artificial one in some cases, in some instances. Uh, Paula, please go ahead. You have your hand raised. You'd like to add? Yes, I wanted to ask you if in your experience so far, uh, exercises and uh, activities are embedded in the open textbooks uh, uh, you published uh, till this point. So which is the role of students? In, in That's a good somehow. question. Um, we've had different uh, types of um, textbooks, indeed. Uh, one of the first ones we published uh, was barely had any exercise exercises or interactive activities more uh, this was more of a collection of lecture notes uh, published together to take the student uh, along with them on a journey through this uh, subject this was in uh, the subject of philosophy uh, so this was a more or less um, classic uh, sort of publication textbook type of thing but we also had other and still have and still are working on other publications that are way more student centered in terms of engaging the student and taking it, taking him or her along um, and integrating um, their potential learning path and their potential learning experiences in this in the process of working with these textbooks. So we've had both. And we were also careful not to limit um, the teacher, the author to one or another to give the flexibility to approach both. But I wonder how you went about it, Lambert. Yeah, that's a super interesting question. So uh, I, I first, I must admit that most of the projects we had until now were more like a static output. So without much of exercises and things. But uh, recently, last year, we did a, a small pilot where we had a experimental textbook just for one seminar of uh, University of Applied Sciences in Hanover, where we uh, encouraged the students to take their own textbook. And uh, we prepared it in a way 
that they could run queries and do something with data within the textbook. But this was more like an experiment. But I think we are today at a stage uh, with things like Jupyter Notebooks or so, where you can do a lot within a book, right? So you can allow a student to keep a copy of their book and run queries from the book, do something with data, try with data visualizations and all, all of these things. So one great demo that was mentioned uh, in our last workshop um, is the Turing way. The Turing way is a famous mm -hmm. textbook already from the field of data science where they follow this approach. But what I mean, this is, I, I, I think these are edge cases today. So mostly it's interesting to make use of these, uh, of this to, to um, uh, allow the students to access the material very quickly and, and, and without any additional effort and everything else like interactive exercises and so on. To me, it seems like they are an extra. <laughs> Um, I'd like to add to that, even if you're talking about a more um, yeah, traditional form of textbook where it's uh, less of uh, this interactive um, activities or exercises, you can still um, make it about students and you can still involve your students greatly into um, fine tuning and refining and uh, finalizing uh, how you go about the textbook as an author. So what our teachers did, even the ones who uh, didn't integrate as many um, activities in it, in the text, uh, they still piloted um, the textbook or specific chapters in their classes, gathering the comments and the feedback from the teachers, uh, from the students. Uh, somebody used it in the perusal system. It's a sort of social annotation kind of system um, for students where they can interact with the text, leave uh, comments, questions, um, upvote, downvote each other, uh, so that the teacher could see what the bottlenecks are, what the sort of the gray areas in understanding could be. Um, this still incorpor incorporates a lot of student feedback and a lot of student actorship in it. Uh, even though we don't see it in the final product, we mostly see it, uh, he or she mostly sees it in the process as the creator of it. So there's still a lot of room for including that, even in the more traditional uh, approaches to, to working with open textbooks indeed. Definitely, definitely. And I'm glad that you mentioned this because I feel so this is something that I already learned from our two workshops here. Uh, it, 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 it shaped a little bit my own thinking about open textbooks. I think that we have far more often today the situation where somebody who is a teacher and has this typical situation of giving a class or something is at the same time the main author or at least a contributor to the textbook that they use. And this is a super interesting thing, I, I guess, because they, they know very well the textbook because they they uh, contributed to it and uh, th thought about it. Oh, how sh what should it look like? What, what, what is the design of our textbook and so on? And now they are teaching and using it. And of course, it's possible for them to gain feedback and, and, and uh, even allow students, maybe in some cases, to contribute to the next version of the textbook. And this is super interesting. And we, I think we did not have the situation before. This is a super interesting aspect of uh, open textbooks. Yeah, indeed, indeed. With this, I'd like to take us to the next question, uh, which is still in this block uh, of setting up the Open Textbook Service and Project. Uh, what was the initial support you offered as uh, you know at the beginning of the project, as part of the project? And maybe this also um, helps us shed the light on the role of library and the, the role of the library in this process as well. Um, so what was uh, initially offered um, as a support? Sh sh shall I start with the yes, response? Please, yeah, yes. okay, that okay. Would be yeah, more yeah, natural. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If it's, so, so by the way, to all of our audience here, if you feel like you have something to contribute, you can use the chat already. And we can, at this later stage, we can open up the discussion, but do not lose it. Use the chat and make your notes already or additional questions, whatever. And uh, yeah, so what we, what we are, uh, one more librarian, good to know. So uh, what we uh, offered uh, uh, initially uh, in our first uh, open textbooks projects were like um, 
helping the initiators to find out what they are really looking for. So I think the jargon is design thinking also. So um, to ask them, okay, how do you imagine the final product? So what would this book look like? What is the audience? What is the way the audience would engage with the textbook? Is this like the typical class situation? Is it in preparation for an certain exercise or is it uh, not just a textbook but also a handbook for practitioners in the field sometimes it blends over a little bit right and and to help people to really find out what is our mission how can we put together in a few sentences what what the goal of our open textbook project is this is seems to be in many cases very helpful and a very good starting point and let me add one more thing often it's also a psychological thing that you encourage people to try it so because they will run into certain obstacles they will run into complex questions building a new book is never easy it's it's like really it has its complexities right and uh, to be someone who is there and tells them, okay, we do not do this the first time. We can help you, really. And you can do this, we are sure. We, 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 we can do this together. So, so one, one, one thing, uh, helping them to design the mission, the ultimate goal, and then to encourage them to follow through the next steps. Beautifully said indeed, Lambert. Thanks. Um, from our side, uh, indeed, we started with the exploration phase, as I mentioned, we asked the teachers um, if there is uh, already an appetite for uh, publishing a first open textbook. And we also admitted that we are just maybe one step ahead of you. Of course, we can rely on the expertise that our uh, publishing colleagues from the University of Groningen Press have built up, which is enormously uh, valuable. But in terms of the open textbook um, world, we would be just maybe one step, sometimes half a step ahead of you, and sometimes walking along with you. Uh, so that was also an honest um, exercise um, for ourselves as well. Um, and we uh, try to make an emphasis on innovative, but also student-centered projects. We try to encourage the teachers to think in that uh, regard. Um, and the approaches and the projects they came to us with were far more innovative than we were prepared to facilitate. We had some expertise with, um, as I said, open, ex uh, open access monographs, so more like traditional um, type of um, output publishing, uh, where we would use the, the open monograph press, for instance, as the platform for publishing those. But the ideas with which the teachers came in, including all those interactive uh, possibilities, um, student-centered study lines, and so on, and involving students as co-creators, as co-authors, they went beyond the technical um, possibilities we had at that moment. So we understood that we do need to, um, to, to look further, to look outside, to go back to the drawing table, to provide a different type of service uh, to the teachers who would be authors of these open textbooks. And then we would provide to them uh, in their research capacity with their research head on. And very soon on, uh, we also learned that students will also be our target audience. Students will be helping or uh, present uh, either actively or a bit more passively um, in the picture in any case. So we would have to uh, like expand the service a bit further to also uh, take into account a student as an author or a co-creator as a co-author, um, which was also a challenge. As I said, for us, we had to build things from scratch. Some of them, uh, some of them luckily were already in place uh, from the previous efforts of the University of Groningen Press indeed. Yeah. I have another question, Mira, and uh, I'm I'm really curious. Um, so, in your uh, textbooks projects, when you talk first with people and and offer your support, are, are they already sure who will contribute to the project as an author? Because it seems to be sometimes. So sometimes you have the situation where you have the one professor who is really the main contributor. But sometimes it's also that uh, people involve others to contribute to their project, be it as an additional author for a certain chapter or be it as someone who adds graphics or something. Uh, what, what is your experience with this? Do they all already have the team, so to say, when, when, when you start going with them? 
it really depends. Uh, some came with uh, no more than just an idea of the book they'd like to uh, to prepare. Of course, they, we asked them to fill in uh, some forms for us to understand the relevance, the audience, the the size of the of this undertaking. Uh, so some just came with an idea. In in those cases, it got um, you know expanded into sometimes more collaborations or collaborations with students, while others came with an almost ready manuscript that they would like to um, then format as a textbook and publish as a textbook. And in those cases, it was mostly the work of one person. So then, uh, you know, um, looking backwards, uh, they wouldn't be adding any more participants into the mix. Um, while the ones who came with an idea, um, they were still quite open as to how this will shape in, shape out and how, what kind of form it will take. So what really helped is showing them examples of what already exists out there, either in their field of expertise or using the approximate tools they would like to be using. And that gave them, of course, that spurred on new and new ideas to for them to develop, to follow up on. And sometimes it uh, turned out that they uh, need a colleague uh, to be involved or they would like students or student communities to, um, yeah, to come in and, and take part and that is of course a very difficult um, thing because then you need to not only manage yourself as a uh, as an author as a teacher as a producer you also have um, a group of students to at least coordinate if not you know manage to maybe a more like detailed extent so that adds a level of complexity and um, we didn't understand uh, all of this at the beginning and neither did they did, did they neither did uh, these enthusiastic teachers who wanted to go and jump onto this journey so it's a uh, a really wide uh, scope of answers. What about yourself, Lambert? Uh, what kind of experience do you have with it? Yeah, so one one thing from my experience is that often um, there are people who, who who they already know. So I, one could say, okay, there is maybe the the lead initiator or so often, typically of some textbook project, right? Or maybe one or two of them or so. And often they have contributors in mind very often because they know they, their peers, they know who is capable of adding to the project, that's for sure. But what they often do not know is exactly how we best play together. So this is what you, I think this is also what you mentioned with uh, managing the group, right? Mm -hmm. So this is uh, everybody who's working in academia or at, a, at a, some school knows this already. This is a uh, an additional task and additional work to coordinate people. And it takes um, more than just knowing about your subject area, right? And that's not easy and not trivial. And it's also good what we learned is to uh, have some recipe, so to say, or make some very concrete suggestion what uh, the cooperation on the book would look like. So um, to make sure that everybody knows what you expect from them and like also that it's uh, fulfilling and nice to collaborate really and, and work on the project because it's always hard work and it takes time and uh, to have these things in mind and to be able to make uh, suggestions, um, recipe, so to say, on how to work together. This is always good. And uh, it turns out, okay, yeah, you make your experience as you go. And, and the second textbook project will always be much easier and feel more, much more comfortable than the first one or so, because then you already have some idea of how, how these things work out, right? Yeah, yeah, it is so indeed. And um, on the other hand, you might still be surprised because it will also bring some new challenges um, and uh, you might be a bit more ambitious since you think, okay, we've got this, uh, we can expand and go further. Uh, what I find helps in our case, what was helpful, but also from talking to other colleagues from other Dutch universities uh, is having some sort of a workflow, even if it's a, just like a very, um, you know, sketchy, uh, vague uh, plan of how things will go and what to expect at each step. And of course, um, from the support side, from the library or publishing side, you can't always envisage uh, all the difficulties and challenges uh, the teachers, the authors would experience, especially given the format they work in, because it's so different and uh, diverse for each of them. Um, we can still um, scaffold the steps for them in advance uh, to show uh, how long this or that step might take, um, and then give them some tips and, um, well, um, 
just show potential challenges they might run into, uh, even though uh, it's not always a foolproof um, way to to uh, to make sure that the, the, the project runs without uh, interruptions or delays, which always almost always come in our experience. Still, it does prepare um, the teachers, uh, the authors, and makes them think ahead a bit uh, about the challenges they haven't yet met. And so um, we will also, I'm sure, include this somewhere in the notes. We also developed uh, in the Netherlands, uh, several uh, universities together have developed this um, yeah, uh, guide, guideline, guide plan, sort of the workflow for open textbook publishing, depending on the configuration you have in mind. Um, if you're a single author, if you're a group of authors, uh, and also if you're a support uh, staff person, a librarian working uh, behind the scenes, helping to bring all of this uh, wonderful people together and facilitate them along the way. So this is a, it's been translated into English, luckily. This is a very helpful um, set of steps, uh, workflow that I think anyone, everyone would uh, benefit from in our um, environment, in our landscape. And um, yeah, I wonder if our participants have any questions at this point or any insights uh, that have been sparkled, sparked by uh, what we've been discussing and by the questions that Paola also had for us. I wonder if um, our audience has anything to add at this point. And if you do, please open your mic and uh, just go ahead and ask us or uh, type in the chat if that's more convenient for you. I will be the first breaking the eyes if no. Oh no, yes, we have a question from Dominic. Uh, welcome, Dominic. Uh, thank you for your question. What form of financial support was needed or offered? Yes, that is a very good and vital question to answer, for sure. <laughs> um, so the financial support, um, like we divided, uh, we approached this question from two sides. Um, one side is what support we could deliver in-house, what kinds of expertise we already had in-house, where the authors wouldn't need to come in with a, um, you know, with a the, the bag of money uh, to put um, into this project. Uh, so we um, made an inventory of what we have already and what we can cover. And then, of course, very soon it was um, apparent that we needed some extra money to finance some uh, services that we outsource, such as, you know, uh, copy editing, typesetting, uh, if that book is to be published also on paper and not only as a web book. Um, also, potentially any kind of animation or graphic making, those kind of things. Um, and of course, we were faced with a choice. A an issue of selecting a different platform uh, additionally to the platform we already had for publishing open access monographs. So in our case, we chose to go with Pressbooks um, as our go-to platform for publishing web books, interactive open textbooks. And we needed money uh, for that as well because we chose for, um, for hosting services from Pressbooks instead of implementing it ourselves uh, because we didn't have enough um, people power, enough FTEs uh, to set in um, from our in-house um, side of things. So uh, to answer this question, uh, luckily, as I said, we were also part of a broader movement of a broader development and the open science program started around the same time. We um, started looking into the open textbook publishing pilot and we were able to get some um, small initial financing to cover some parts of this incoming um, open textbook project requests from the open science program budget to have this kind of impulse financing to get us going, to run these pilots, to run these projects, see if they can become a, a service, a permanent service that the library provides and see what kind of a financial model would be sustainable for supporting. Um, but we did not ask our teachers to come in with money. We um, were clear that this is a pilot. We have a little bit of financing that we can provide. Um, and this is how we'll be going about it. What about you, Lambert? Where did the money come from, actually? Yeah, yeah. I, I have to give one very concrete piece of advice here. So if you operate in an academic environment, I would definitely recommend that you ask people to consider open textbooks when they start uh, uh, writing their grant proposals. 
this is a very early stage and we do, we do not talk about huge amounts of money but it's super good to have in your proposal plan already one small special budget for the textbook and for the dissemination section so every funder will ask you about your dissemination strategy right it's perfect and very excellent not just to mention the typical journal article as something which helps to communicate within science within research but also to have in mind already an open textbook and and give the funders also uh, an idea that you want to have an open textbook which is really um on 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 the cutting edge of what 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 is possible today with with living books with maybe collaborative contributions whatever so and uh, so this is an excellent goal to 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 talk with your researchers already when they do their research proposal and one more uh, one or two smaller hints on what to consider what kind of costs to consider so there was one larger project that we did where we invited authors to come to writing sprint events and for these it was super uh, important to give them a small amount of money to uh, so that they can um, come to the event right so traveling costs hotels something like this this is very good if, if, if you have something in mind like this also one one thing that is particularly helpful for many textbook projects from my experience is uh, to set aside um, a small budget for a professional professional editor who in the last stage of the project uh, revises the whole document so so that you can tell your authors okay right now do not care too much about grammar or so but instead focus on like the um, didactics of the book that you have the target group in mind that everything fits well together and so on and then you have this uh, editorial person who can be a professional that you hire from externally who takes care of uh, many of the other smaller things. So, just two ideas, maybe. Yeah. yeah. I would also uh, like to uh, to answer the question from Michelle here in the chat. I was able to open the chat. Uh, she's wondering how we can help move uh, the authors who are benefiting from royalties uh, to open access. Um, and I understand you mostly mean in textbooks. Uh, it's a big ethics concern for you. Um, indeed, uh, it is so. Um, from our talks with the teachers, uh, none of them were from the category of the ones who benefit from big deals or uh, big royalties. So maybe that hurdle was out of the way in that regard. Um, but how we can go about it, I guess, or at least try to go about it. Well, first of all, it would really help if um, they were convinced on the value level, on the indeed ethical level of the uh, importance of uh, going open, embracing open education, uh, not only um, in terms of your research as open access, because it, there seems to be more or less a general agreement that at least um, in the Netherlands, but I also assume in some other European countries that open access is the way to go in research or is the right way to go to strive towards, even if it's not 100% possible, still we could be uh, getting that direction. It would be good to also talk to them on the value level in terms of education. What also um, works um, sometimes, it also uh, that um, in our case, uh, the teaching output that these types of materials, uh, textbooks, um, the ownership to the copyright on them uh, belongs to the, the the institution, to the employer, in uh, according to the Dutch law, according to the collective labor agreement of the Dutch universities. So technically, um, the teacher cannot be producing materials on the employer's time and then selling them outside for making profit. Um, you know, of course, we cannot be sure how it happens and what kind of time is used and so on. You can say that it's also a very edge case where you can debate if it's an educational output or research output that can all take place. But uh, essentially, the idea is that publicly funded um, education and publicly funded educational materials uh, should not be sold for profit, should not be used for profit. And I'm not sure what um, what the regulation, I think, Michelle, you're from Ireland, you mentioned, what the regulation is in Ireland, but maybe this is another argument to use when talking to the teachers in this regard. Um, besides, you know, the ethical, the value-based arguments that, uh, that you can have. Uh, but of course, um, 
Another one I'd like to add here is that it seems uh, from our own experience, from uh, us monitoring the, the, the numbers we have, the data we have, is that um, the, the, the titles, the chapters, the open access monographs are being better downloaded and read and used when they are in open access, when they are available for free in open access and then print on demand for small cost, of course, mm. because you have to cover the, the printing costs. Uh, so um, perhaps the same applies to, to textbooks, to open textbooks. If uh, the aim of that teacher researcher is to enrich, uh, to uh, enlarge the outreach of the publication, then open access is often a better way to go about it. Uh, so maybe this could be another argument. Um, but if it's someone who's making <laughs> lots and lots of money uh, and that is crucial for them, then I wouldn't know how to persuade them at this point unless there is an institutional policy that, um, you know, um, explicitly um, prohibits uh, or uh, has a very strong opinion on, on these types of endeavors uh, that happen within your um, contract uh, with the university, for instance. Yeah, thank you, Mira. My The guys have gone on their lunch break, so hopefully you can hear me okay. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, thanks. That's a very, uh, very clear answer. And I agree with everything that you've said. And actually, as you were speaking, I I think that I, I've chosen to, to start at the most difficult end if I choose to go with those authors who are profiting. Uh, and they're, they're a small cohort, but they're very wedded to the, the royalties and, and uh, it's, it's probably the wrong place to start. So maybe the right place to start is at the enthusiastic end, where the people are already engaging in some open research and open publishing of their work. I agree with you, Dominic, as well. And it was a very evident message and thread at the Libra conference last, uh, the week before last, that you know, if you're, and this was from the, the librarian from MIT and also from other colleagues that, you know, let, let's look at our library spending. If there's material that you're buying every year that isn't being used, then take some of that money back and cr perhaps create an open access, open publishing fund. And you can, you can administer that in any way you see fit in your libraries, uh, depending on whatever, you know, what governance you have there over your book funds and so on. So I think the, it's not just the implementation of the service that we're looking at here. I think there's a huge change mountain um, that we have to climb. And but but I'm glad it's underway. And I really do feel like there's momentum around this now. So the questions that we ask at webinars like these are really about the technical implementation. But but we do know that it's it's scaling that mountain, too. So yeah. thank you. Definitely. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, brilliantly put. Indeed, it's part of a larger iceberg uh, that we only see the top of sometimes. Yeah. Um, but we do need to approach it more um, systemically, more, um, you know, um, yeah, it, it, as a holistic process, indeed, and ask ourselves deeper uh, questions that go into the very essence of um, scholarly communication, scholarly publishing as well. That also translates to uh, educational resources publishing, of course. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, let me add one more thought about the interesting discussion also which happened in the chat here. Is, uh, and this is this uh, question, yeah, the whole question uh, where we are now, um, how can we convince people to use the open way, so to say, to work, right, as a scholar? And I think one uh, thing to keep in mind about this is that uh, when it comes to open textbooks, we have additional, very unique additional benefits of openness, even when compared to open access. So for instance, one typical claim of Creative Commons licenses and openness is that it's possible to reuse and also to remix and change content. Normally, with a normal journal article, this is not very important, right? Because a journal article is already a finished product, so to say. It's only from those authors, and then it's being distributed, right? While with open textbooks, we have a very different uh, experience. So one of the first training handbooks that I helped to develop here in Hanover was uh, since then uh, translated in at least four different languages. And it helped a lot that we had this platform and it was there and there were no questions needed to ask because it was openly licensed. And for those translation 
efforts which came from the community, from the this were like small grassroots projects. Uh, this was much easier than without openness. And this is a typical thing. I, so I have never experienced that I worked on any open access journal article, which would have been translated because why? Nobody translates journal articles, right? Why, while a good handbook can have an additional impact when it's translated. And so, so there's um, so the thing what what matters about an open textbook is different, or the way it impacts a certain learning learner community is different. And uh, it's it's good to talk with potential authors also about these things. And by the way, I, I do not want to brag about it, but uh, this hand this particular training handbook uh, has um, then also been recommended by UNESCO and so on. And this is great, right? Like people really learn a textbook as a tool. This is more, it can be more than just one more publication into your CV, but instead it can have a very unique and interesting way of impact uh, also, yeah. Yeah, and educational applications indeed, yeah. And maybe also if that helps um, to convince more authors to follow this path, is that they also should consider the educational use of their textbook in case the university is not able to purchase a license to use that textbook, uh, which might very well be the case with the you know latest developments in the ebook uh, source campaign. Um, sometimes uh, the authors might uh, give up their rights to the publisher, sell uh, the rights to the publisher, and then the university cannot buy it back, cannot buy the license uh, back for the students to engage with this classroom. So a situation where you teach your class and as an author cannot even use your book in your class or can't reasonably expect your students to be able to, to purchase it and uh, meaningfully engage with it, that could be a real situation. Um, given the landscape we're operating in right now um, to prevent that going open in the open access route could be one of the answers uh, to pursue so maybe if you sketch some you know maybe not necessarily doom doomsday scenarios but potential um, hurdles obstacles along the way if we um, if we can continue going the the commercial route only and not um, spend any um, effort on uh, switching to the to open education to the OER mode of things. Um, that could be helpful as well. Plus, if a teacher wants to meaningfully engage with this uh, material and make students a part of this learning experience, um, the copyright protected status might also be in the way, um, as opposed to the permissions given by open licenses, where uh, the material is flexible and fluid as you want to make it within the permissions you have. So maybe that uh, educational innovation and educational design side of things could also be used as an argument but again, depending on each particular um, teacher's context. Um, I wonder if it's time to move on to the next section, um, the rolling up, the rolling out and scaling up um, of the project into the service. Um, if that's happening or if it is about to happen, um, how did you proceed with it? How did you go about it, uh, Lambert? And what helped you in it? Uh, have you already succeeded? Are you still on your way to this? This is a super interesting question, uh, and it feels like, uh, um, yeah, I, I would have to talk a lot about it. No, but 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 honestly, we we are not there yet at TIB. We are still working from project to project, and to me, it feels like we need to have this break even where we make sure that there's one person who is uh, like maintaining the service and knows what 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 is also to do on the technical side of things somebody so if you host your own open source software this is definitely you need uh, to cover right so a person who uh, spends uh, at least a split of their work day that everything is maintained and works well and so on and to also have somebody to manage the operations and so on. And we are honestly not there yet. We are still about to uh, establish such a service. And until then, we go from project to project, so to say, and look into covering uh, what is necessary for each of the, of the project. So maybe I'm the wrong person to ask this. <laughs> but 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 how, how about you, Mira? What what, what um, did it take you to to come from from particular projects and pilots to what you already have in terms of services? 
yeah, <laughs> we're not there yet either. <laughs> we are, however, well on our way um, getting there. And um, a lot of steps have been taken in that direction. And you can say that, you know, any minute now <laughs> or any day now will be there, hopefully. But first of all, uh, as I mentioned, we were using the framework of the Open Science Program for uh, give, getting ahead and proceeding with uh, the, the pilots, with the projects that we're running right now. Um, and we were trying to be smart about it and to be more sustainable um, in the long run, uh, understanding that we've now, we are now putting so much effort um, from the human resource, resources side of things. We are building the reputation, the expectations of the teachers regarding the service uh, we are providing, even though it's now within the, the, the pilot. Um, but we decided uh, at the start of the, the, pro the open science program, we already decided to at least secure uh, some fundamental uh, things and costs we will have uh, if we are to roll it out into a service, secure it within the, uh, the permanent budgets. Uh, so for instance, we needed uh, to secure some form of platform funding uh, in right now it's press books, but you know maybe in the future we'll switch to something else. So we decided to um, have a few lines in the program uh, startup documents, program proposals, where we suggest um, this to be this cost, this yearly annual subscription fee, say, to be incorporated into the general library budget, the general um, book budget, which was uh, not an issue. We also showed um, why and how this could be sustainable. So we did that. Uh, there were also some other adjacent services that we thought uh, we needed to secure like this from the start to incorporate it into another budget long term. So we also did that. So that part of things, uh, side of things has been taken care of within, you know, the playing field that we were in using the, the program format. And the, you know, the main stakeholders have uh, signed in on it. Um, but there are some other recurrent costs uh, and human costs that you need to consider. Uh, with the human costs, it was a little a little bit easier. I think by now we have an understanding that the people involved in this uh, pilot, in this project, uh, will be dedicated partially to it further as well. This becomes um, sort of by the way of institutional memory, by the way of, oh, we're doing this already. This becomes part of somebody's um, everyday um, work, of somebody's ongoing work, line work. That's also important um, to uh, sort of put uh, in black and white, uh, black and white um, into the project evaluation uh, documents and recommendations. And we are doing it now as we speak. So that part we also took care of. Now, the part of additional funding for those extra services that we need to outsource, as I've mentioned, you know, the copy editing, the typesetting, potentially some, uh, you know, some kind of graphics or design things, those we usually outsource. Uh, so those are the ones where we still um, struggle with how to make it more sustainable long term. And maybe indeed um, what I think has been mentioned by uh, Dominic in the chat, um, also tap into that uh, whole conversation about the library budgets, the license budgets uh, that we pay to the big publishers. Uh, if we could also secure a chunk, at least a small chunk of that, uh, some percentage of that uh, to finance uh, these efforts, that would help us make our service um, full and complete, at least to go on with, with full confidence that it will be sustainable and it will not stop as soon as the, the money uh, runs out. So I would say we're two thirds there and you know we'll be getting there hopefully. Um, but yeah, it took, it took an effort. Uh, it also took great, amazing examples of the teachers coming in with their projects. What usually works best to persuade um, along with the financial arguments, but also you know, from the practical side of things to persuade the decision makers, the management team is the examples, is the actual examples and the diversity of examples within the pilots uh, that we've had and we're still having. And uh, also the line of teachers coming into us willing to continue next year, to come in with their projects and start next year. That also usually persuades when we uh, tell, okay, we also have this, this and that project in the pipeline. Um, therefore, there is a really clear request uh, from our main target audience to continue with it. Um, so a combination of both is is playing uh, is at hand in our uh, in our case. We're now busy with six uh, projects. Um, some of them we have already finalized this year. Some of them will still need to be um, published this year. And uh, this will all be um, finished within the first edition of the Open Science Program. And we have five more uh, that are waiting in the pipeline. So we're using that as well um, as one of the arguments when asking for continuation for the funding and so on. 
Yeah, yeah I can subscribe a lot to your uh, answer to Dominic's questions in the chat about library budgets. This is super, super important. I mean, once you have these uh, um, first one or two projects that you can point to, that you can refer to. So here's, here's, here's a one open textbook our teachers did. Then you have a good starting point to negotiate, to at least talk about the library budgets and to convince people that it's maybe worth it to have at least a small sp split of what they would otherwise spend on another su su uh, subscription bundle on commercial textbooks on their own ways of producing textbooks. So it's a, a sustainable choice and, and it's an ethical important decision. It's a strategic um, like a uh, decision about uh, what what yeah what are the digital capabilities of your organization what, what you can do in the digital realm on your own and um this gives you a great starting point and and uh, the sooner you start to talk about your library budget um the better it's it's definitely worth it yeah 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 agree uh, i say we proceed to the next question. So how was it developed in a permanent service? I think we've answered this um, in that a little it bit, yeah. either <laughs> hasn't yet or it's on its way or um, will be there soon. Um, so I would also like to ask both of us, uh, but also the participants, if they have any experience, what works very well? What did you find works well, uh, has worked well along your way? And what lessons learned and advice do you have at this point? Um, Lambert, if you could please start answering this, what works well and what lessons learned um, did you have besides what you mentioned already, of course. So, so what worked well for me so spontaneously is um, that uh, I have um, uh, teachers and professors who were super satisfied with their own open textbook projects that worked very well. And, and they they were often even helpful to spread the message elsewhere and, and to be an evangelist of uh, open textbooks, so to say. Um, this is not sufficient by no means, but but it's one one important little thing, I guess, that that you take care or, or also have a close look if, if, if those people who you help to, to, to produce their own open textbooks, that they have a um, good experience and, and that they help you to, to, to spread this message. I think this is, in a, this is one, one important point. What, what, what I often find hard and what, what, what works not so well is building this sustainable perspective of funding. This is, uh, from my experience at least, at this German library uh, where I work, this is much harder. So but is, how about you, Mira? Is, is it helpful to have uh, satisfied uh, people uh, contributing to textbooks? Um, yeah, for sure. Definitely. Mm. Uh, it does help. It helps in, uh, you know, uh, spreading the good word about it. It does help in building your case when you talk to decision makers. But it also makes it more interesting for us, uh, also on the support side, to develop this service. To have this wonderful, creative, enthusiastic educators who come to you, think outside of the box, challenge you in many ways, in a good way, I mean, in a good sense, uh, makes your work uh, worthwhile and uh, makes it more interesting. So I think it's also one of the unexpected sort of um, catches of, of engaging with this project. Uh, the enthusiasm is very contagious. Um, you do get enthusiastic as well. I mean, even though you are a believer in the cause, I would hope, and this is an important, you know, value question and ethical question uh, to go uh, with open access and open education. Uh, but these practical matters help as well. Uh, what also went well is um, how much space there was, I think, uh, in the teacher's own practice to involve the students. We didn't think that that would resonate so well with them, but I think uh, as soon as they saw examples of others doing it, of others engaging in open pedagogy, open pedagogical practices, they saw uh, a lot of potential for making their uh, class experience more meaningful to the students and uh, making uh, what they are creating together with the students more, uh, yeah, corresponding to the to the. Uh, to the current issues, to the current challenges that we're all facing, solving real world problems to some extent, even though in a form of, you know, creating a textbook or, um, you know, adding some, some suggestions and some chapters uh, in a publication. Um, so 
that that went quite well. All, all of these active learning practices, flipping the classroom to the student side, uh, even though it hasn't yet resulted in a fully student-led publication yet, uh, but we're there. We see a lot of interest from student communities and teachers as well. So that's that's really good to hear. And what's difficult, of course, um, as you said, thinking in the long-term perspective, making sure it's sustainable. Uh, some some things do not depend on our efforts. Uh, some things are part of the larger conversation, as we've mentioned before in uh, with Michelle, um, that this is sometimes larger than our pilot, our project, and sometimes than our university. Um, those kind of things uh, sometimes frustrate me personally. Um, and I know that sometimes we need to be patient. We need to do our best, but also you know, try and, and see uh, where this is going systemically at a larger level. Um, but what I also found uh, interesting is that, um, well, it's it's not uh, like something that went bad, but some a lesson learned is that you should always remain a cheerleader. You should be a cheerleader for the authors, for the teachers, for the students involved. Um, as you said, Lambert, there has to be someone who's uh, on whose plate it is to uh, coordinate things at the end of the day. Uh, so the big lesson learned is that find that someone, make sure you uh, have the sort of the, the topic owner, uh, the, the domain owner in this case, and make sure that person or those people, uh, very often it's way more than one person, are the cheerleaders. Um, well, ready to go along to the end, together with the teachers, ready to support them, ready to take down some of the barriers that are along the way and minimize this um, entrance, uh, barrier entrance as much as possible, um, because that is what we what we do. That That's uh, essentially in, in your um, well, job description, so to say, or in your ethical uh, considerations when you decide to work um, in scholarly communication and as a librarian, for instance. Um, yeah, so that was that was a big lesson learned as well. I wonder if our audience has any comments or questions at this point. I see that Dominic has a, a comment that individual institutions should work together in producing these open source textbooks. Very true. Often the, the same curricula is taught at uh, different institutions, different levels. We are buying the same textbooks. Very true. And uh, well, our colleague Sylvia, who couldn't today, unfortunately, be with us, would have given their wonderful example. Um, they partnered. She's from uh, Freie Universiteit in Amsterdam. They partnered together with several more institutions to create this well, um, amazing example of a collaborative textbook um, called Environmental Toxicology, uh, where uh, authors from many countries, I think it's uh, more than, I don't know, uh, 60 authors or something contributed to it. Um, and I'm sure we'll find uh, the, the link to share with you at some point, um, which was uh, also the answer to this observation, to this question uh, that, yes, we can be uh, more sustainable and stronger together if we join our efforts not to replicate um, the efforts, but to make sure we uh, keep them going in synergy with a more synergetic effect. Um, and another side to this working together question is that we can also work together on building infrastructure. Um, different institutions are facing very similar problems as we hear, and it doesn't matter if you are within the same country or, you know, at different sides of the continent, we most likely face very similar issues. So sharing the expertise, but also trying to build this infrastructure sustainably is another um, way we can go about it. And I have an example, a small example, uh, again, it's at the national level um, here in the Netherlands. We are talking um, to other university presses to see if we can together uh, buy, um, finance a collaborative shared account um, in, a, uh, in our case, Pressbooks platform. But this could be any platform you're working with. So maybe the next step, um, besides encouraging your authors, uh, your teachers to collaborate with others in their field, maybe the next step would also be uh, to talk to other um, support staff, to other professionals, uh, supporters of open education at other libraries and see if you can together crowdsource, crowdfund, or um, minimize the costs uh, by the, you know, by the, the scale um, of this approach by buying in some services together or outsourcing some services together. That could be our answer uh, to, yeah, to, to fight this, this issue. 
Yeah, I mean, sometimes I even think that we need to think, uh, if it's possible, uh, to think more like a traditional publisher, at least in that way, that we uh, seize the opportunity that is out there. So sometimes a new field uh, or new challenge uh, uh, is just there and uh, there is not much of a modern digital uh, textbook that is covering this already very sufficiently and then taking uh, these uh, opportunities and and uh, the the more institutions you involve the better right so so that it does not appear like okay you build your own special solution which is maybe helpful for the classes taken at your university but instead really to to uh, um, connect uh, stakeholders in that field and and allow them to collaborate this is something which has a or can be potentially can have a huge impact and wherever you go uh, think about it in your field what 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 are the opportunities what does it take to to uh, collaborate on something larger and then you have scaling effects you have maybe funders or maybe local authorities also who are willing to spend a little bit so that you can cover the costs and so on so uh, yeah I agree say. Agree, a really good addition, Lambert, agree. Yeah, I wonder if we can go forward, let's. Uh, so we've already covered the question and insight. Um, let's skip to the individual work part of this workshop because it is a workshop after all. So what we'd like to ask you right now is to take some minutes, uh, let's say six, seven minutes, or as long as you need um, within, you know, the understandable uh, amount of time and reflect on your own prospective open textbook pilot. So we've prepared um, this kind of uh, guided um, worksheet for you, where we ask you to reflect on what resources you already have in house, what kind of uh, identity your institution has, what kind of, um, well, thematic uh, orientation most of your uh, teachers would have. Um, and please, write it down in this document. Uh, please uh, make a copy of the file you get a link to. I think Paula must have copied it in the chat. Thank you, Paula. And uh, make a copy of the file, either save it to your own computer or to your Google Drive and work in your own individual file. We will take, let's say, seven minutes for this and we'll uh, come back in seven minutes and discuss it with you. So please take some time and reflect. And maybe you are already further along the way that is great to hear from you, how you implemented it, what kind of services you had in house, you could rely on, what kind of services you had to outsource. So let's work on that. Yeah, m maybe one technical hint. I'm, I'm not sure if this is uh, totally evident, but in the file menu of uh, Google Docs, you can choose to make your own personal copy, right? So there's a menu item make a yeah. copy or something to that extent and uh, yeah. yeah 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 indeed the instructions are on the screen the file make oh, okay 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 it's already there yeah 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 but thanks a lot for narrating yeah. it thanks lambert make, make a copy and save it to your own computer or google drive and talk to you soon talk to you in a few minutes take your time
Okay, please take one more minute and we would like to see you back in around one more minute. Take some time to finish your thoughts and you can always go back to this document, of course, to continue. We don't expect you to be able to fill it in in one go. Okay, um, I think it's time to return here to the general session. And um, thanks a lot for taking the time to sit down and reflect a bit or start reflecting. You can always continue after this workshop, of course. And we would like to um, see your insights, to hear your insights. And what we would like to propose now is for all of us to collect uh, these insights and answers in the Padlet. Uh, the Padlet that uh, Paula will share a link with you in the chat for. Please uh, just copy and paste uh, the answers you'd like to share, the answers you feel comfortable sharing. You don't need to indicate your institution or country. If you feel like it, please do. Please go ahead, but you don't need to. You can also keep it uh, anonymous. Uh, please share your insights for each of the um, each of the categories of questions we asked you. Would be a really interesting exercise for all of us to see how it's going and what kind of um, needs there are, what kind of educational developments we can connect to. And I will uh, try and go broadcast the Padlet. Just a second. Oops. Can you see the Padlet now? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. And the answers are coming in. Thank you for sharing. Let's take a look at what we have here already while you're still filling in the rest of the, uh, the columns for this subject. First of all, our institutions, as I see, are um, quite broad. Classic university, research library, multidisciplinary university. So quite a wide range of institutions, not um, some technical schools, for instance, or um, you know some other very uh, narrow field of study, field of research type. And we are also talking about broader educational developments that we would like to situate open textbook publishing in. In this case, uh, somebody's sharing that their library strat strategy is open, inclusive education, uh, sustainable development goals, of course, innovation in teaching, uh, continued learning, so lifelong learning. All of these topics, I'm sure, come across in many university strategies and library strategies. So there are many points we can um, connect to in this case. Would anyone like to share their particular experience, their individual experience? How is it at your library? 
where are you at right now? And where do you think you can still um, go on? What would be your next steps? What kind of expertise do you already have? What would you like to outsource? Please feel free to open your microphone and talk. We'd appreciate that to, to hear from you. Or maybe also, uh, what is it what you still need to find out about open textbooks before you start your project? Maybe there's something, so one step <laughs> that you additionally need before you try something on your own. And you can also use the chat, of course. You're welcome to use the chat as well, not only the open mic, whichever is more comfortable. And I see from the answers that um, the expertise you'd like to outsource uh, to other experts are typ the typical publishing uh, expertise, right? The illustrations, uh, so the graphics, uh, editorial review twice, copy editing, those we also uh, outsource um, at, in our case, for instance. So I recognize the situation indeed. And there's a lot of expertise that the libraries already have. Kapala, please go ahead. Yeah, while listening to you and uh, listening to all the comments and uh, that participants provided so far, and thank you for all your insights. Um, I have no. I was thinking about my own experience in uh, in the university I work in. We don't have uh, um, any experience in open textbooks so far, and um, it seems strange because. Uh, we are talking about this and uh, been studying a lot about it. And I'm sure that uh, from other people's experiences, we could benefit quite largely from it, but it's difficult to start. And uh, while listening, uh, my focus was in, uh, on the difference between instructional design and the project management. Those are two different uh, angles that uh, we should look at open textbook projects and uh, the experience we have around uh, creating a massive open online courses is very similar in a way because they are still um, intended to support uh, learning activities and teaching activities too, but uh, thinking about the learners first. And uh, it's not only that you have to, to know uh, pedagogical methodologies and uh, uh, extra instructional design strategies, but you are also uh, required to manage projects quite well because many people are involved, many resources, uh, timing and uh, skills. And um, I was thinking that it's not a problem if you don't have all the skills at the beginning. Piloting something, is uh, the best approach possible in my in my head to start verifying what you have, where, how far you can go, which are the, the the challenges that you are facing, and then reach out to solve them, asking uh, for help, and not only inside your institution but also to the community. That's something that uh, we used to do in the annual, for example, from time to time, and this is one of the opportunities where I'm learning a lot from you. But I think that uh, sometimes people are frightened about starting a pilot because they think, how many things should I learn? How many skills should we have in our team? Not all of them. Uh, start small. And uh, this is something that I really wanted to, to say. It's uh, We are at different level. We have different uh, uh, teams. Uh, that work with us. I don't know about your experience, Mira, and your Lambert, but I think that you also were lacking uh, someone or some skills that you would have loved to have in the team. And then you had to decide to either outsource or to go ahead without them. Um, it's fine. That's what I, is, is it fine in your experience yeah. also? For sure. Yes, definitely. I mean, <laughs> you will never come 100% prepared um, for all of the sites. And at some point, we also managed to involve um, the, the didactic colleagues, didactic experts, 
they weren't there to begin with, but at some point we saw a very clear need for them because not every teacher is, uh, you know, an educational designer and educational developer um, that doesn't go hand in hand. Not every teacher is a project leader, a project manager doesn't need to be so. Uh, but I'm also really happy to see this type of expertise being listed as something that our uh, participants already have in-house. Uh, it's a different mix, of course, some traditional library expertise as copyright or some kind of publishing advice, printing process kind of advice, but also things that go beyond that. So really happy to, to see this diverse mix. And I think we can, yeah, you can start uh, with small steps, but already there you have a lot going on to begin with. What about you, Lambert? What's your impression? I would definitely agree. And uh, maybe we need um, a generous uh, setup so that everybody uh, who participates in such a pilot can grow in their own roles and uh, so because so the the teachers need to overcome these uncertainties ah is it can it be a, such a good textbook if it is an open textbook things like that and uh librarians other supporting staff need to learn what it takes what what are the typical tasks so how to overcome certain technical problems uh, and uh, we all need to be respective uh, about that and uh, so every one of us has to learn a little bit and um, and, and still it can be a wonderful um, experience to to take this um, adventure together and uh, I, I can really recommend do do, do not expect uh, the the perfect uh, picture book example of a textbook on the first take uh, but it's it's still worth it um, to try it together yeah yeah stick on to that yeah indeed that's uh, for sure um, a very well a very good way to go about it and what we did at the beginning we reached out to the colleagues within the Netherlands who already had some experience and just asked them for a call that's as simple as that just reach out to someone you know to us even uh, or someone within your own country uh, context and talk to them and ask them and some questions will surprise them some questions will show them that they are not there yet themselves either uh, and together you can come to a nice um, description of a service you'd like to be providing or uh, things you could be outsourcing things you could be inputting yourself other stakeholders you can involve within your institution so just reach out when we're in it together we're learning from each other a lot. We don't need to reinvent this wheel, just as our teachers don't need to be reinventing the wheel all the time. Uh, same here. Lots of expertise is already out there. Lots of good, uh, like well-prepared um, slides, reasons to use open textbooks and so on. Just tap into that, into this collective um, knowledge, collective wisdom. Yeah, and uh, good luck. It's a really rewarding experience indeed to be um, doing this, this type of um, well open ed education support. Yes, and I will switch. So the, the board remains here, the Padlet remains here if you want to uh, to go to it, but I will switch to the slides and we'll just finish up our presentation, our workshop today. Um, yeah, if you're curious to learn more, we're inviting you to the next Open Textbook Workshop, a last one of the series dedicated to the open textbooks, but not the last one at all in the general series, Embrace the Open. So the next workshop here would be about the open textbook publishing kitchen. So we'll get to take a look into how things work with the publishing platforms we use, with the technical expertise you need or you need to outsource in this case. And we'll try to talk to uh, collect a few different examples for you to learn from. And uh, please also come in with your own examples if possible, if you already have some in mind. It's on the 12th of September, also in the afternoon during the lunch break, uh, one o'clock uh, Central European time. And the link to register is ready. It's active. You can already go ahead and sign up. And of course, we use some open images here. And thank you very much, all of you, for joining. Paula, handing the floor to you. Yeah, no, you, 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 you said it all. So thank you. Thank you for being with us. And thank you, Mira and Lambert, for your insights and for guiding us through these interesting uh, uh, reflection and activities. Uh, I hope that uh, we will continue with all of you in the next future with our next uh, workshop. Thank you, everyone. Bye.